Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Is the mic any better or is it still? It's good. Okay. All right, great. All right. Well, as you know, we've been uh, studying. Our main study is Luke chapter 21. But that's led us now into a study uh, in the book of Revelation of the fifth seal judgment. And that is leading us into a study of the fifth of the seven letters uh, to the churches found in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. As the Lord has prophesied in regard to the great persecutions that will happen during the tribulational time period, the persecutions that happen also throughout the church age, where believers are uh, persecuted all the way to martyrdom, as we are going to see like never before during the tribulational time period. But that uh, leads us into understanding what that tribulation is all about, that seven-year period of the Antichrist ruling here personally on planet Earth, the various judgments that are brought against the world of unbelievers during that time, the seal, the trumpet, and the bold judgments. We are now focused on that fifth of the sealed judgments, the great martyrdom that is found in Revelation chapter 6 in verses 9 through 11, as we've been noting. And in regard to that, again, a great prophecy of the martyrdom that's going to occur, but also the great blessing that the receivers will believe when they get into the eternal state, having that uniform of glory for those who have been uh, positive towards the Word of God throughout their entire lives, plus the many other blessings that go along with that, as we have been noting, and will continue to note as we are now focused on Revelation chapter 2 and uh, uh, the... Uh, the study of the church at Sardis. So in regard to the study of this fifth seal judgment that's going to happen during the tribulation, we've been noting the various analogies and typologies that are found throughout the Word of God that give us greater understanding of these things. We've noted the number five in numerology, talking about grace and how grace is involved both for the believer and the unbeliever in that sealed judgment. The color white was in view, the uniform of glory, the great blessing we get in the eternal state. Now we're talking about the fifth of the sevenfold messages to the church. We'll talk about the fifth of the seven praises that are given to our Lord in Revelation 5.12. The fifth day of creation, we'll talk about the fifth result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fifth trial of Jesus Christ, the fifth saying that he had upon the cross, and then the fifth of the seven feasts of Israel. We'll note each of those and talk about them and their uh, import in regard to the understanding of what this fifth seal judgment uh, and, uh, is all about. But in any case, uh, we are focused now on the fifth of the seventh-fold messages to the seven churches that John the Apostle wrote while he was on the island of Patmos, as you know. And in this letter, it's the letter to the church at Sardis. It is a fantastic message, and it's really what we call a wake-up call for the dying church. And so that's what we're noting this morning and continue to understand the principles and precepts that are found in that message. But he, here again is the map of where Sardis resided. Again, you could still go to that uh, town or city today and see the ruins of the ancient days uh, when the letters were written to the churches and also prior to that. It was a great city, as we've noted a little bit about the history of uh, the region of Sardis, uh, the various false religions that were there, and also now the great church, uh, as we're reading, that was there during the time of the apostles. That is what we know as Turkey today. It was Asia Minor uh, back in the ancient days. But basically, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, in verses 1 through 6, let's read that message once again. And then we'll get into really verses 2 and 3 this morning, uh, understanding the message that God is giving to this church and really to all churches uh, who may be in this situation as well. Now in verse 1 it says, And to the angel of the church, that's the individual pastor teacher of the church. Again, the church in Sod is right. He who has the seven spirits of God, really that's talking about God the Holy Spirit, his spiritual perfect ministry towards mankind, and the seven stars, that's talking about the seven pastor teachers of the seven churches. It's the plural uh, where uh, the angel is the singular, because again, angel in the Greek, again, angelos, means messenger, and it's really talking about the pastor teachers of the churches. It says, uh, say this, I know your deeds, and again, specifically to the church at Sardis, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are 
dead. And again, you have a name, talks about the reputation that they had uh, as a church. It was a positive reputation because they were a good church prior to this point in time and they were going forward in the will and plan of God that you are alive talking about the spiritual life that they have as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ their positional sanctification as we noted on Tuesday night it says but you are dead again it's not talking about spiritual dead it's talking about uh, the uh, experiential sanctification, that they're not producing divine good. And all the works that they were doing at this point in time were now dead works. They get outside the will and plan of God the Father. They get out away from the fervency for the Word of God. They weren't being filled with God the Holy Spirit. They were still performing deeds as a church. They were still gathering together and doing their churchy church type of things, but they weren't going forward in the plan of God. They were now what was considered to be a dead church. They had no spiritual growth, and they weren't producing divine good. Now in verse 2, the instructions from our Lord begins with, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what? And I'm going to correct that. It really should say, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and kept it, or and keep it, and repent. If, therefore, you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white. Again, the uniform of glory, for they are worthy. Verse 5, he who overcomes, again, the winner believer, as we've noted, shall be clothed in white garments, the uniform of glory again. And I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this morning we find ourselves now in verses 2 and 3, which is kind of fascinating because, as I've noted, this church was not going forward in the plan of God. They were not walking filled with the Holy Spirit. They were not uh, intaking the Word and applying it in their life as they once were as a church. Now it was more about the social event of gathering together and maybe the do-goodism of helping people here on planet Earth. They were not walking by the Spirit. They were walking by the flesh, as we see throughout the New Testament, that terminology used, which means by their old sin nature. They were walking under the old man, the old self, as it says within the New Testament, based on the various translations into English that you might have in your Bible. But it's all talking about the old sin nature, living as if an unbeliever, uh, even though you're going to church and you're doing church things. You're still living like the unbeliever because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not producing the fruit of the Spirit, the divine good that you should. And as a result, God is warning this crowd, warning these types of believers. And <clears throat> just to remind you, and uh, whether you uh, uh, have studied this in the past or uh, uh, seen this interpreted this way or not, but some people have tried to interpret the seven letters to the churches as a progression of the church and sometimes progression with regression of the church over the last 2,000 years. And they try to take each letter and say, well, that was the early church. The second letter was the next group. The third was the next group. The fourth was the next group. And they talk about the ebb and flow of the church and maybe what's in store for the church towards the end. That is not the appropriate tr uh, translation or interpretation. This is not a timeline of the history of the church during the church age. Throughout the church age, there has always been ebbs and flows in the life of believers collectively around the world. And then in any particular region or country or church, there is always ebbs and flows in how that church is functioning and operating, sometimes on the upward trend, other times on a downward trend. So this is not a history of the timeline of the church, but it's a message for those churches and specifically the people in those churches who have lost their fervency for the word of God and are not taking in the word as they had been previously consistently and applying that within their lives and producing the divine good that God has planned for all of us to produce. 
So in regard to this, in that message to the church at Sardis, which is a message to any given church at any given time uh, throughout the church age, we see a five-fold wake-up call, as it were, a reproving and a rebuking of how they were functioning and operating as believers. And so, again, on a Sunday morning, here we go, okay? But in any case, uh, you know, one thing I would also want to remind you of, and I think about this often, is sometimes we get into these types of messages that are the reproving and the rebuking, and, you know, sometimes they can be more on, on the negative side, as it were, instead of just peace, hope, and love, and joy, and happiness, and all those things that come along with it, okay? But this is one of those negative types of lessons to get us to wake up and to get us to realize if we are falling away in our spiritual walk, if we are getting a little bit lapsed or lazy in our intake and application of the Word of God, and then, again, in our service amongst the church and amongst our community as well, in our witness out there in the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're getting a little bit lapsed in that, this is that type of wake-up call that we all need to receive. And remember, I only get you for about three hours a week. The world gets you for about a hundred and a hundred, hundred and hundred and hundred and hundreds of hours during the week, okay? And, you know, the TV and the radio and the Internet, they're all over you all the time. I only get you three hours a week, okay? At best, okay? I get you for three hours a week. So sometimes, again, the Lord uses this opportunity for that real, oh, I should V8 moment. Oh, I should have been doing this. Oh, I should be doing that. And this is that type of message that I'm giving you this morning. And again, I have no excuses for it. I'm not trying to make excuses because this is what we need to hear. This is what we need to learn. And especially in the United States of America today where we are waning away from our relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Waning away from our walk with God. And again, talking with Gary, it's actually I think it was on Friday, when I did talk with him and uh, gave him the update about his back and his status and whatnot. But, you know, just in the conversation of the recognition of just the simple Ten Commandments being removed from our schools and our courtroom and our society. Just that alone. Again, if we just had a list of those Ten Commandments that are in our lives each and every day, reminding us of the right and the wrong of life, how much better would society be today if we only had that? And that's just a drop of the entire Word of God. So again, you know, as we remove God from our lives more and more each and every day, we're going to get into this type of society, and especially within our churches. And it's funny how God, yeah, He'll judge and avenge the unbelieving world during the tribulation, and, and He has His hand upon it, you know, even in our day and age. But God is focused on what? His children. You and I, because we are His close and personal and intimate relationship individuals. We are the ones he cares really about and most about because we are his children. So he is trying to give us that warning. He is trying to give us that wake-up call so that we don't fall into a negative aspect of our spiritual walk and unfortunately lose out on the blessings and rewards we could be having in time and then also especially in the eternal state. So as we go back, and let's uh, now go through the message that our Lord has here. Back in verse 2, it says, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. And so again, we see the number five here because as, you know, we're talking about the fifth seal judgment. We're talking about the fifth message to the seven churches. And in the fifth message to the seven church, we have a five-fold warning that God has given to us. A five-fold uh, uh, reproving and rebuking. So again, we see the number of grace in this message. And when God disciplines us, keep that in mind. It's always His grace working diligently within your life. Because God doesn't want to see you operating in a negative way. God doesn't want to see you operating in a place that is of this world and of sin and of hurt and pain and of loss of blessings in time and eternity. No. God wants you to be walking in His will and His plan each and every day so He can pour out His blessings onto you now and forevermore. So again, this is a grace message as we understand and define it. 
So within that, the first thing that we see here is that we are to wake up. And God wants us to wake up and, re and rescue our spiritual life. And again, talking to the believer who is falling aside. And maybe that's all of us. Who knows, you know? And I'm sure with all of us that we do get involved in the world a little bit too much. And we do get uh, caught up in the things of the material world and material blessings a little bit too much. And instead of delving into the Word and getting our relationship with God and thinking about Him first and foremost in all that we do, okay, we are distracted by the details of life. And it's funny, you know, with all the technology and the great science that we have today like never before, you know, my wife and I talk about this all the time. You know, think back in the day when they, you know, were an agricultural company, uh, 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 society, and they had to farm, you know, to live. And they had, you know, you know, sheep and cattle and whatever the case may be. You know, there might have been a carpenter over here or something over there. But they didn't have all the distractions that we have today. And as they would go about their daily life, they had a lot of time to think about God, to think about creation, and to think about everything that God has done for them, you know, all around them each and every day. But today, it's all facing the phone. Do -do 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 -do. Facing the phone, facing the phone. If they're not on the phone, it's on the TV. Not on the phone, it's on the TV. Okay? One after another, we are totally distracted. And we don't think about our relationship with God. So, again, when we get overwhelmed with that in our lives, we are losing out on the spiritual life. And so this is a wake-up call to rescue that spiritual life that God has given to us. And it all begins, first and foremost, with the imperative mood. Remember, all of these commands that I'm giving to you, all of these five things are in the imperative mood. A command by God, first and foremost, to wake up. And again, that word wake up is ginomai, I've given that in, in your notes. And uh, uh, that word does mean to be or to come to be, okay? And then we have Gregorio. That's the Greek word for wake up here. And that means to wake up, to stay awake, to be al alert, to watch, to be vigilant, to be diligent. You see, that's what he's saying to us in regard to our spiritual life. Be diligent in regard to that spiritual life. Get back to a place where you used to be. Oh, yeah, yeah, what's going on back there? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm sure it's fine. All right. But in any case, you know, they had to wake up from their worldliness as to what was going on. You see, they were doing a lot of works. They were performing a lot of tasks. They had a reputation as a good church. Because, remember, the world looks for things out of people, not the spiritual function and matter that otherwise we should be giving. So they were doing a lot of good things from a worldly perspective, but as God said, they're all dead. There is no life in what you're doing. There is spiritual death here in regard to your daily walk. And so they were not producing the divine good as they should have. And so God says, wake up. Wake up to the worldliness and the uh, overwhelming uh, material things of this world that you are focusing on rather than getting involved in the Word of God as you should to have the change in life that we all need to have. The change of walking with God. The change of thinking about God first and foremost. The change of offering up prayers to God and thanking Him for all the things that He has given to us day in and day out. You see, they were lacking the, uh, the diligence of their spiritual life. They were not taking in the Word of God any longer. Their church became a church of, let's do this thing, let's do that thing. And how many churches do we see today? It's about the rock concert, it's about the music, it's about this society, it's about this club, it's about that club, it's about this uh, topic or that topic, or it's about serving here or about serving there. Again, so many of our churches today have lost the fervency of the Word of God. They're not taking in the Word of God. They're not applying that to their life to have a change in their life where they are not giving over to sin and sin temptation. They're not thinking about themselves first and foremost. You see, in today's society, it's all about me, myself, and I. It's about the things that I have. It's about the things that I can have and the things that I get myself. 
It's about the material things that are around us, and it's about taking care of A, number one, rather than focusing on the things that are God, the things that uh, make for a spiritual life, the things that make for divine good production, where your service to other people is done in a right way filled with the Holy Spirit, based on the Word of God, and you have the change of mentality within your soul where you're not giving over to the sin and sin temptation that we see so much in our world today. You see, they did not have the, the vigilance to focus on their spiritual life, and they would fall into a spiritual type of slumber. So again, wake up means they were asleep. They were just going through the motions. They were sleepwalking, as it were, in regard to the spiritual life. Oh yeah, a lot of activity, a lot going on here, a lot of entertainment, a lot of excitement, but were they really doing the things of God? And as God said, no, you are alive, but you are dead. And the things that they were doing were nothing but dead works, which we call human good works, that are wood, hay, and straw burnt up uh, at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. So again, their culture was dying. They were ineffective spiritually in the things that they were doing. And so as our Lord begged, really begged the disciples during his time in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night in which he was arrested. And you all know the story, and I'll show you this passage in just a minute, Matthew 26. Remember how he pleaded with the disciples, can't you stay awake with me? Just come with me and be with me. And that's all he wanted. You see, they went into the Garden of Gethsemane, had a big dinner, had the Passover supper. Their bellies were full, and they had probably a little bit of wine, okay? Now they go out to the Garden of Seed, and all they could do is think about sleep. All they could do is think about sleep. Even though Jesus was going through the most difficult time in his life up until that point, knowing that the cross was next. And Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he wanted to pray to the Father, but he also wanted their company. He just wanted them to be with him. He wasn't asking anything from them, like, oh, encourage me with this word, or pat me on the back, or tell me how good I'm going to be, or you know, give me comfort and say everything's going to be fine. He didn't ask for any of that stuff. He just said, can't you be awake with me? Can't you just be with me right now? And sometimes, you know, with family and friends, and sometimes even strangers, the best thing to do is just to be with them they're having a difficult time. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to offer anything. You don't have to do anything. Just be there and be awake and be ready for whatever they may need or they may ask you for in that situation. So as our Lord pleaded with his disciples to stay awake with him, that's what he's pleading with the dying type of church and the believer that is not going forward in the plan of God. Just stay awake and be with me. Stop being in that slumber of Satan and his cosmic system. Because you are in that spiritual uh, slumber when you're overwhelmed by the things of this world. Again, in Matthew 26, verses 40 and 41, it says, He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And again, this was not the, you know, it was like the third time, okay? And said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour that's just one hour that's all I'm asking for one hour because he knew when these guys were going to come and arrest him one hour that's all I ask all right he says keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation and then the poignant part the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak again when we give over to the old sin nature and the temptations of sin we are going to be weak in regard to our spiritual life and even though we may say, I want to go forward in God's plan. I'm a good Christian. I want to have a relationship with God. Yeah, we could say that. The spirit is willing, but the flesh. Are we allowing our flesh to take over, the sin nature take over, and not lead us into that? You see, if we, if we are saying and desiring, I want to go forward in the plan of God, then that's what we should be doing. We can't just say we want to go forward in the plan of God. We have to do the going forward in the plan of God. So again, that's what Jesus Christ is exhorting all of us to do. Wake up and get back to a place where we are going forward in the plan of God. And then the second mandate that he gives in regard to the first is wake up. Now he says, strengthen the things that remain. 
And again, you see the Greek words up there talk about fix or establish, support, confirm, strengthen those things that remain. And this is an interesting word, loipos for remain. Those things that are remaining from now on, we could say, for the rest uh, of, the, uh, of what you have. And uh, it also means other, like other people or other things. You know, this is a noun, this loipos, so it's talking about an object. Even though we see, and I'll show you the second context that we have here in just a minute from a time standpoint, but the word really is talking about a thing, okay, from a noun perspective. And what is that thing that remains? What is it? A little bit of spiritual life that you have. A little bit of doctrine that you might have within your soul. And also, you all have the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. You may not be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time, but you have the indwelling. That is in you. It remains. And whatever word that you had previously in your soul, that too is still there. Whether it be just the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for you and through him you have eternal life. So the wake-up call says now strengthen a little bit of things that remain in your soul. You've got the base You've got the foundation. Now build upon it. And that's why, again, in other doctrines for another time, we talk about building the edification complex of the soul. You've got the foundation of salvation and the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Now build upon that with what? The Word of God. And whatever word that you had, now build upon it. Well, how do you do that? By delving further into the Word of God, doing what you're doing today, studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and then, as we're going to see, applying the Word of God in your life. So strengthen the things that remain is part of that wake-up call. Wake up, rebound and recover, as we're going to see. Wake up from your spiritual dead walk, sleepwalk, we could say, and now start to strengthen your soul. Build that edification complex of your soul with the Word of God. Take in that doctrine on a consistent basis. So the main focus is take the little bit of doctrine that you have within your soul and now build upon it. Word by word, line upon line, precept upon precept. Build the Word of God that you have in your soul with more of the Word of God that can be in your soul. That's how you strengthen your soul. You see, you can't strengthen your soul by doing good deeds. You can't strengthen your soul by doing good works, okay? It doesn't happen that way. You build your soul, you strengthen your soul with the Word of God. Plain and simple. Because this is the power that God has given to us. Not the works that we do, but the Word that is in us. And then, once we have the Word in us, the works will follow. But unfortunately, the cart goes before the horse in many churches and in many people's and believers' lives. Where they want to do the works, but they don't want to do the word. Okay? Or I should say, they want to do the works, but they don't want to do the work of taking in the word of God. Because that's where it is. And that's what it's all about. And the believer going forward in the plan of God is one who is learning the word of God consistently and then applying it to their lives. And then with that, the second concept here is the time frame, okay? Strengthen the things that remain. Yes, what remains in you is a little bit of the Word, the spiritual life that you have. You've got the regenerated human spirit. You've got a, spe uh, a, a spirit that can understand the Word of God. You've got the Holy Spirit to teach you the Word of God. But what also remains in your life is the time frame in which you have. You see, the Lord hasn't taken us home yet, has He? No, we're still here. Okay, We're still part of God's plan for our generation. And as long as we wake up each and every day, regardless of how much in reversionism we have gone, God has a plan for us today. God can use us today. And God wants to build our soul today. So again, the secondary concept here is the time frame that remains. That we still have time to go forward in the plan of God. So utilize that time wisely and continue to go forward. So the command to wake up and strengthen is to rescue that spiritual life that God has given to us by taking in his word and then applying it diligently within our lives through the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit while we still have time to do so. And you see, the time frame is going to come in in just a minute because we're going to talk about 
the discipline that God can bring into our lives if we don't go forward in the plan. And you all know what the third stage of divine discipline is, don't you? Yep, the sin unto death, where finally God says, you know, there's, there's no hope, okay? There's no hope, so I'm just going to take you out, and I'm going to bring you home. Because he knows that we won't repent at that point, and we're just a, a miserable wretch here on planet Earth. So in grace, God takes us out in divine discipline. And it's discipline because he's cut short our time to produce divine good, to glorify him in time while we have opportunity to do so. And we are no longer vessels that he can use here on planet Earth. So he takes us out. But as long as we're still here, we have time. And we have time to be vessels of honor for God to be used in a fantastic way. So even from the little bit of Bible doctrine that you have resident within your soul, as our Lord says, and as I was just speaking, the things that you have were about to die. Okay. So the warning message, the shot across the bow to the church of Sardis is, you have a reputation, you were doing uh, you know, uh, good things, you were producing divine good at one point, but now you're dead. And the things that you do have, strengthen them. Because if you don't, they are about to die. Okay? So, it's kind of interesting. I like the we're about to die here in that, uh, you know, tense of this language because it gives us an indication that God knows all things. You see, as this church was going on a downward spiral as a church, and if they continued on that trajectory, they would be wiped out as a church. They would, as individuals, be brought out under the third stage of divine discipline. But God knows that they're going to come back up. And that's why he's giving them this message. They were about to die. These things, the little bit of things that you had were about to die. But I know from this message, you're going to wake up and you're going to rebound and recover, and you will continue in the spiritual realm. You will continue in the spiritual life here on planet Earth. And so again, they were about to die, but because of this warning that I'm giving to you, again, I know that you're going to recover. But the message is, if you don't recover, they will die. Those, those things will come about. So as I've noted, this is a warning of the divine discipline that God brings into the life of his children and to his churches as well and this is where again as over the past week I've been talking about not, not only from the individual perspective but also from the church perspective you see individually God works in our lives and he brings about discipline to wake us up so that we don't stay in a spiritually dead place of non-production and uh, not walking in the will and plan of God so he does that so to wake us up but as I said if we don't third stage of divine discipline he brings us out under the sin unto death guess what the same thing can happen to a church as well you see as a church collectively if we are collectively a spiritually dead church and we stay on that trajectory guess what one day God's gonna wipe the church out and say well you didn't really want the church anyway you didn't want to go forward in the plan of God you were just playing a churchy church thing a bunch of dead works really no impact whatsoever so I'm just gonna take the church out because you didn't want it anyway and he will bring about divine discipline onto the overall church so again we have to recognize that if we happen to be that type of church in any given generation if we aren't walking going forward in the plan of God and entering into that spiritual type of deadness, as it were, of non-production, God can take us out and remove us as a church, as it were. So again, it's a warning of discipline that God brings that culminates in that third stage of divine discipline, which is the sin unto death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we get that doctrine from. We see that God disciplines his children because he doesn't want them to be in a place where he can't bless them. He doesn't want them to be a place in, uh, 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 of hurt and difficulty. He wants them to be in a place where they are productive. They are going forward in the plan of God, and he can bless them each and every day. And again, we see it in Revelation chapter 319, and then also the Psalms as well. 
And just to remind you, in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 32, it says, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. You see, that's the three stages of divine discipline. The first stage is that weakness, and again, uh, util uh, utilizing you know a physical ailment type of thing. You know, when you first get sick, yeah, you don't feel so good. You know, you kind of uh, you know a little, little off, and you don't have the strength and the energy that you had. And then, as the sickness and illness now really takes effect and uh, progresses a little bit more, now you're really sick, and you get the nose running, you get the headache, you get the fever, you get the chill, whatever the case may be. And then, if it's not treated, as we've seen with COVID. It could take our lives, okay? Again, God utilizes that analogy for the weak, the sick, in a number sleep. No, uh, again, sleep being dead. They die physically, as it were. So we recognize the three stages of divine discipline. That in the first stage, again, that weakness comes in. And again, it could be an ailment that comes into our life, or it could just be something else where we don't have the fervency that we used to have. And things don't seem to be working the way they used to work in our lives. And things are a little bit muddy and a little bit cloudy and a little bit messy within our lives. And a lot of, you know, uh, difficulties are surrounding us each and every day. And then if we don't wake up in that respect, then we get to real sickness where we have big trials and tribulations that are coming our way. And again, this isn't designed initially as suffering for blessing. It can become that if we rebound and recover. But it's first designed as a discipline, where now we have bigger things that are happening, more hardship, more difficulty, more pain and suffering within our lives. Designed to do what? Wake us up, to get us to realize, hey, I'm not going forward in the plan of God here. And these things are happening because I'm being disciplined by God. Just as the child knows, and, uh, you know, and, and talk about even my grandchildren know that these principles okay and when they are disciplined okay they wake up and they say oh you know talking about Emily's kids too especially you know mommy I know I was wrong okay and they apologize okay and they know when they're off they know when they're wrong and if you bring about that discipline they learn from that situation well same aspect goes you know for us being the children of God he wants us to learn from the things that are happening in our life, especially if we are backsliding or going into reversionism and, uh, God forbid, complete apostasy within our lives. But then it goes on to say, but if we judge ourselves rightly, and again, do you judge yourself rightly or, or are you trying to think of yourself as better than you are? And again, a lot of people try to deceive themselves, saying, oh, I'm a good Christian, I'm a good Christian, I'm a good Christian, but yet they live a life of hell, okay? And they live a life of worldliness and sin. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. This also means if we confess our sins and rebound and then recover. Again, it's one thing to confess the sin, but the confession of sin is there so you change what you've been doing. Not that you continue to do what you were doing and just live in that and keep confessing, 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 confessing. Okay? That's not the spiritual life. No, you rebound, then you will recover. You change. You say, no, okay, that was wrong. I confess that to you father i know that was wrong that 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 was a sin thank you for the forgiveness of that sin and now you go in a different direction okay that's what it's all about not just keep doing the same stupid things over and over and over again but if we judge ourselves rightly we would not be judged but when we are judged and again this is by god we are disciplined by the lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world and again, just step back and think about the whole tribulational time period. And we've already talked about all the judgments that are going on, the seal leading to the trumpet, leading to the bowl, okay? And we've already studied all of those. And don't you see how it starts off a little slight? You know, a little bit of thing here, a little bit thing here, then it gets a little bit more heat, a little bit more heat, a little bit more heat, a little more, you know? And again, God is doing that. He's designing that for the tribulational time period to try to get the people to wake up. And again, this is now the unbelieving world, trying to get them to wake up from their spiritual deadness, to get them to believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their Savior so they can have eternal life and avoid the condemnation of the lake of fire. So again, we see God dealing with this in all realms, helping us wake up to the reality 
of where we are in life. And so again, you know, God provides these things so that it can be the betterment for us each and every day. Remember, the number five, this is all about grace. This is an Old Testament principle too in Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is the man who, whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. And again, when we Old Testament, they talk about the law. Again, a system of uh, rights and wrongs that we understand. Now we have the entire uh, canon of scriptures that we ought to be learning from. Again, who you teach out of your word, we could say today. The word of God. But blessed is the man whom you chasten. The man that you discipline. Because it's a blessing to receive that so that we don't continue in the negativity that we've been in. And so our Lord indicates his verdict also upon this church in Sardis in their human good works that they were performing, in the spiritual deadness that they were walking in. Again, they weren't walking experientially sanctified. They were outside of fellowship with God, living in sin, but yet performing churchy church type of things. He says, uk plureo, they're not complete. They're not accomplished. They're not fulfilled. In other words, I've got a lot more for you to do. I've got a lot more for you to do. And I want you to do those things. But if you keep walking in the way that you're walking, according to sin and the world, and uh, not focused on God, not taking in the Word of God, and allow it to change your life, change your mode of operation, change your behaviors from sinful to holy and righteous ones. Again, it won't happen. And as we operate by our sin nature... Our works are not com accomplished. They are not complete. And we have more to do. And God has designed more for us to do each and every day. And so what we recognize is they weren't fulfilling God's plan for their life. Their works were found wanted. They did not qualify as the fruit of the Spirit. They were certainly not going to be judged at the Bema Seat of Jesus Christ as, you know, rewardable for all of eternity. But you see, that's what God wants for us. That we can be rewarded for all of eternity. That we can be blessed by Him in time rather than being disciplined by Him in time. And so when the discipline of God comes into our lives, again, if we don't heed its warning, it goes from first stage to second stage, could culminate in the third stage. Sin unto death, He brings us home. Okay? Enough is enough. Okay? And He just takes us out. But at any point, if we go from the weakness to the sickness, and just up to the point of the sin unto death, if we repent at any point along the way, rebound and recover, again, God can change the whole thing around. And any trial or tribulation or difficulty that we were going through or any discipline that we were receiving by God that was designed purely for discipline, that had no rewardable aspect to it whatsoever, now all can be changed. And it will all be changed to what we do call, as I said earlier, suffering for blessing. Suffering for blessing. And now, as you endure the rest of the illness that you may be going through, or the rest of the trial and tribulation that God is bringing you through, or the rest of the difficulty that you have to endure, or the problem that you've created because of your bad decisions, as you have to endure those things now, rather than being disciplined, now, as you endure it with God, and you're positive towards His Word, and you're turning it over to God and applying His Word to the situation, now, all that you're doing is suffering for blessing. And now, those things will be rewardable in the eternal state. So at any point, if we wake up, rebound and recover, strengthen the things that are in our soul, what was dead now comes alive. What was unrewardable now becomes rewardable. And what was hopeless now has much hope involved. You see, the blessings of God are designed to get us to wake up strengthen our souls so that we can be in a place of God's blessing each and every day. And that is the grace of God. So then we uh, move on to verse number three, but I don't, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to save that for Tuesday. And we have three more aspects of what God is trying to do with them.
giving them the instruction to wake up. And just to give you the highlight, in verse 3 it says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. So the three aspects that we see there, let me just give you those real quickly, and then we'll come back and get the detail on Tuesday, is that we remember. Remember how you used to do things? Remember how you used to be on fire for God? Do you remember that? The days when you couldn't wait to get to church, you couldn't wait to hear about the Word of God, you couldn't wait to learn what's in the Word of God? Hopefully those days are for you right now. And then you diligently pursued the Word of God, and then, again, turn back to living the spiritual life. And so when we come back on Tuesday night, we'll talk more about all three of these aspects, about remembering, being diligent, and turning back to that spiritual life that, again, we might have walked away from. Hopefully we are not in that position. Hopefully we are fervent for God. Hopefully we're taking in the Word and applying it in our lives and going forward each and every day. And hopefully we are living the spiritual life because that's God's desire for each and every one of us. And the grace of God has provided that for us so that we could be blessed in both time and in the eternal state. All right, so unfortunately I was hoping to get through all of that this morning, but uh, as you know, time flies. But in any case, we'll come back on Tuesday and we'll uh, uh, finish this up. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We glorify you. And uh, thank you, Father, for being a loving Father in our lives that sometimes does require you to bring discipline upon us to get us to wake up. And Father, as that wake-up call comes to us, help us to respond to that each and every day so that we do get more fervent and diligent in our walk with you, glorifying you as we serve one another, but also have the change in our lives that is necessary to live the spiritual life. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's precious name, amen.